My name is Julia Jones. I'm the VP of Business Development at Agilex Biolabs here in Australia. During my 30 year career, I've worked with both large global and regional CROs, whose focus is working with biotech companies across almost all therapeutic areas and in over a thousand phase one to phase three studies. I'd like now to introduce you to Jason Valentine, Agilex founder and CEO. Hi, my name is Jason Valentine. I'm the CEO of Agilex Biolabs here in Australia. Just by way of introduction, I started my career in the industry in 1994 as the first analytical scientist in the first phase one unit set up in Australia. I soon realised over the coming years that Australia had a part to play in global drug development and the speed with which that can occur. So I've spent the rest of my career um, building CROs and bioanalytical facilities to that end getting drugs to market faster and ultimately improving quality of life and, and saving some lives along the way. What I'm here to talk about today is the Australian uh, clinical trial industry and the advantages that it can have uh, from uh, a, a global clinical trial perspective in terms of quality, speed and cost, which are the pillars of uh, decision making that you would need to go through to make a decision to come to Australia. I'll talk a little bit about the COVID-19 situation and how that's affected trials globally and also within Australia, and then talk about how you might go about scoping out Australia as a destination for clinical trials. So by the end of this presentation, hopefully you've got the information you need to go to your board and state a case as to why Australia makes sense. I'll start with quality. If we can't tick the box on quality, there's no point uh, progressing. The, the reality is Australia has fantastic key opinion leaders, some great principal investigators that have been running clinical trials for decades. The CROs uh, are au fait with FDA and EMA requirements. And in fact, the whole Australian uh, service provision industry sets itself to that standard because ultimately that is the client base that Australia is servicing. Most CROs in Australia and service providers will be able to talk about situations where their data has been presented to the FDA or EMA with success. So that's the technical quality, the regulatory knowledge, uh, equivalent quality to anywhere else in the world. I did want to touch on the quality of service specifically. Australian CROs recognise that it can be perceived as a negative that there is a time difference between the two countries. And Australian CROs, as a result, have um, built into their DNA working out of hours and really focusing on delivery so that that perception can be blown away the first time you work in Australia. You actually talk uh, here clinical trial um, uh, staff talk about the concept of a, a longer working day where actions can be taken in the afternoon in, in, in local time uh, where the client's based and then the Australian businesses can work through the night to deliver outcomes overnight. So in a way, extending the working day. So quality service is a real focus and equivalent expertise to anywhere else in the world. Just moving on to the timeliness of, of, of Australia. Australia has the Clinical Trials Notification Scheme, which is uh, the process by which uh, clinical trials are approved to be run. The burden of the review is on the Ethics Committee and the TGA issue a letter of acknowledgement to allow the study to go ahead. Now that process is a five to 10 day process. Um, end to end, you have to have your data in two weeks before the Ethics Committee process but the total time frame is approximately five weeks. Now for healthy volunteer early phase trials, that is the extent of the process and it's a very competitive timeline anywhere else in the world. I'll talk about late phase uh, later on, um, but the other advantages from an early phase clinical trial perspective are that you don't require an IND to, um, to do your trials in Australia, which means if you're a small biotech or pharma company thinking about going in an IND process, you can get critical human data, sometimes a little bit of efficacy information to boost the value of your asset ahead of an IND, which is incredibly beneficial. Uh, GMP material is not required for first in human trials. Uh, that's also another time-saving advantage. 
So with regard to later phase trials, there is a governance process that's required on top of the regulatory process in Australia. Uh, and that takes up to three months. So the regulatory process in itself, coupled with that governance, isn't quite as um, beneficial, but equivalent to what's available anywhere else in the world. From a late phase perspective, some of the advantages are around the access to the Asia Pacific region and the ability to access in a local time frame those um, therapeutically naive uh, markets to fast track patient recruitment, which is a real benefit. And Australia in itself isn't as um, saturated with clinical trial activity um, and, and you're able to get trials run there also. So that's the speed advantage, primarily around early phase clinical trials, but some key advantages for late phase as well. Moving on to cost. The R&D tax incentive in Australia, 43.5% rebate, cash rebate, is an enormously beneficial program that's been running in Australia for several years and is utilised exclusively, certainly our client base, uh, if they are eligible, are utilising uh, the R&D tax incentive. What you're required to do is set up an Australian subsidiary. There are some rules and requirements. You need to be less than $20 million in uh, revenue. Uh, but our clients are, are, are utilising this uh, all the time and it's a well-trodden path for US and European clients to be um, using this scheme, which is an enormous advantage. Um, some uh, things that you just need to watch out for, you, you do need to use um, uh, good R&D tax providers and most CROs and service providers in Australia will be able to help you out with uh, a person uh, that they can refer you to to use. Um, there were some early issues with repatriation of uh, funds and repatriation of IP and those sorts of things. In the early days, if you use a quality provider, it's absolutely no problem and we certainly don't see any of those issues moving forward. So talk to your CROs in Australia uh, and service providers about who to utilise for that process and you'll, uh, you'll be um, very happy with the cost saving that it provides. Uh, CFOs uh, love the cost advantages. So they're the three pillars of advantage that I talked about, quality, speed and cost. Now I'm just going to talk about COVID-19 and the impact that's had on the industry from a global perspective. This is a recent um, uh, uh, paper that came out from Global Data on the 14th of May, just a visual representation of the hotspots around the world uh, globally in terms of COVID-19. Clearly, Europe and, uh, and the US have been significantly impacted. Uh, Australia, as you can see, is uh, in, in quite, a, quite a good position. How's that affected the global clinical trials market? Some information recently put together by Global Data suggests that there are 826 trials that have been impacted globally. They're, they're trials that there has been some sort of public notification that they've either been delayed, slowed, or have had enrolment suspended. 50% of those studies are in the United States and approximately 30% of those were in Europe. So Europe and the US have significantly suffered from the lockdown over the last couple of months. And we are starting to see clients coming from uh, Europe and the US looking to um, find options to run their trials having been stalled in other jurisdictions. So Australia. This is the Department of Health um, States and Territories report from about a week ago. And um, this is how Australia has fared through the pandemic. Um, this is cases per day. Most countries are used to seeing these, these, um, these types of, of graphs. Australia has uh, fared fairly well. Uh, a couple of things, we're a fairly dispersed population. Uh, we don't have high density, medium density uh, housing, uh, certainly not as much as in, in other jurisdictions. And um, the government have been really strong on clamping down on, on people that are not honouring the social distancing rules and people have been getting fines and um, we, we got a great level of com uh, compliance very quickly. Uh, the government have also been very focused on the medical advice and although it's had economic impact in all sorts of areas as it has around the world in travel, travel and hospita hospitality, 
uh, they've they, they've not jumped to um, bending to those economic uh, pressures, and we still only just on the 11th of May have had some of the restrictions that were enforced earlier um, uh, rolled back to allow us to. Uh, continue to have even 10 people uh, in a social gathering. Given that we've got three weeks of, of very few cases, that's a, that's a relatively conservative approach. So how has it affected the Australian clinical trial industry? Well, the clinical trial industry in general was designated an essential service straight away, which means all of the uh, clinical trial facilities have been able to continue. Hospitals were impacted initially as they were preparing for an influx of COVID-19 cases, um, but uh, they didn't eventuate to the extent expected. Um, and, and, and so many hospitals uh, have only had limited impact and patient studies have been able to continue. There have been some slowed down, but with the rollback of um, restrictions, they're looking to start up again. Phase one units for that period had to decrease their capacity to 50%, only using every second bed in their facilities. That's actually not a 50% reduction in capacity. They usually operate at, at 70, 75%. So it's about a 30% reduction. Uh, but trials have still continued is the bottom line. Um, and they've continued across the board, early phase and late phase. And we've remained uh, relatively unaffected compared to groups in uh, Europe and the US. So if you're in Europe or the US and you are, uh, your pro program is halted and you're having trouble getting trials up and running, right now Australia is a, is a great alternative to, um, to allow your asset to continue its development. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that Australia is worth looking at and uh, you've got the ammunition you need to go to your board and, uh, and provide some uh, preliminary justification as to why uh, Australia makes sense. I want to switch tack now and look at how you go about scoping Australia as a destination for clinical trials. Now, I'm going to put up a, a, a list of uh, service providers in Australia. Uh, I just want to be clear that it's not a, a exhaustive list. They're, they're, if, if there are people missing, it's my apologies. Um, I've, I've listed everyone alphabetically. Uh, we work with all of these groups and they're all very good um, uh, service providers. So the point I'm trying to get across here is there's a whole heap of service providers that, that you're going to think about touching base with in Australia, depending on what you require. Now, uh, in my view, the best way to go about that scoping process is firstly to talk to your networks and find someone that has had um, success in Australia or has some experience running multiple trials in Australia. They can be a great source of information as to who to go to to get some good quality advice about the landscape. You certainly don't want to be Googling and, and, and going down the process of talking to all of these um, facilities. There is an opportunity to kind of tailor your process. My suggestion is that if your if your providers can let you know, if your um, network can let you know of consultants that have been really useful, potentially bioanalytical labs initially are a good source and central labs who work with the majority of the CROs and phase one units and have relationships with the hospitals. They're a good preliminary group to approach. They are good preliminary groups to approach to get an initial scope and, and completed. And what you'll get out of that is some of the nuances of, of, of what people's um, best attributes are. So I'll, I'll do this by way of example. If you're a, um, a, um, a company that wants to run a biosimilar uh, trial in, in Australia and it's 300 patients, my suggestion would be to look at Nucleus Network slash Q Farm. Nucleus Network just uh, appointed Q Farm as the phase one unit. That's because they're the biggest unit. They've actually set up their capability in Queensland specifically to recruit for biosimilar studies, and they would certainly be a group you should try. Now, that's not saying CMAX Linear and Scientia have any issues. They're, they're, they're all very good units, but there's that, that piece of information and that nuance that um, people in Australia know about that, that can narrow down your selection of, um, of service providers in Australia. Uh, the other one we commonly get is 
you know, the long-term idea of the program. Are you planning to run a first in human trial? And we had one the other week that wanted to go straight into phase three. Um, that, that could uh, suggest that we choose someone like Novatech to run that because they have offices all over Asia. And if you've got your US arm covered for late phase studies, they could be a logical partner for your existing CRO. So there's lots of nuances in all that, and I could go through a lot more. Um, but I guess my message is, Get some information on trusted service providers. If you, if you don't have any of those, look at the labs and consultants as a first port of call to give you a broad understanding of the industry and talk about your program and, and you'll be able to get some good guidance as to where to start first and maybe restrict that list of 25 down to eight or nine that you know you've already pre-vetted through other sources. And then of course, the CROs and phase one units are in a good position to give you advice about central labs and bio biolytical labs. So you do the reverse process as the second phase. And then you can restrict um, the, the volume of activity you need to go through with good quality information. You just need to be able to trust those sources. Okay, so that's my advice on how to go about uh, at phase one, um, phase one clinical trial, late phase clinical trial startup in Australia. Next, I just wanted to go through um, Agilex Biolabs, a part of our material, our marketing material, and talk about some of the things you might look for when you're down to talking to individual groups. So here's our one of our slides from our presentation, and uh, I just suggest some of the things to look for. Firstly, uh, and, and most uh, service providers will have a variation of this, on the right-hand side, um, under the Y Agilex, you'll, you'll see a lot of the similar, it's essentially a, a shortened version of this presentation. Quality of service, data is equivalent to anywhere else in the world, timeliness of, of the process uh, from a regulatory perspective and other advantages with speed and the R&D tax incentive kind of underlying it all with a cost advantage. Um, that's pretty common. Uh, just looking at the top, Years experience, when you're talking to a service provider in Australia, you're looking as you would be anywhere in the world for 20, 25 years experience potentially with the top uh, tier people you speak to, but always probe the second and third tiers. Who's actually gonna be managing uh, the, the trial, looking for 10, 12 years experience, project managers and study directors that are actually gonna be running your studies. You know, you're looking for five to seven years experience in that cohort. Um, always worth checking that experience in a bit of detail. Also, you're looking for volume. You know, you're looking for multiple trials. In Agilex's case, 100 studies per, uh, per year, uh, 85 staff. We've got plenty of capacity if, if there's holidays and, and, and those sorts of things. So you're looking for a robust business that's got some, some volume. Um, we focus very much on repeat customer rate just because it's a really good percentage for us, obviously, but it's worth asking that question if it's not offered. You'd also want to see that they're working across countries that uh, make sense to you and that if you're in Europe and you're going to be going through EMA or you're in the US and you're going to be going through FDA, that they cover off on the requirements there. And you can tell that from the client base. In Agilex's case, uh, about 40% of our client base is US, about 40% uh, of our client base is um, Asian and about 20% is European. So we cover all bases. Um, with regard to service lines, obviously the services will be different for each of the groups, but one thing to look for is um, growth and just general health of the business. So um, while most companies won't give you detailed revenue information, um, obviously, uh, they will tell you about the um, compound annual growth in revenue. And it's a good indication of, of how groups are travelling, whether they're growing, whether they're growing too quickly, because which can also lead to problems. So you can get some really good uh, information there. So that's my advice on, on scoping out, first of all, the broader um, service provision industry, who's who. And then, and then some of the key questions to ask when you get down to speaking to individual providers. So hopefully that's giving you a bit of an understanding of uh, the Australian clinical trial industry. You've got the ammunition you need to potentially go to your board and talk about uh, utilising Australia for uh, your clinical trial programs. And more than that, hopefully you've got some decent preliminary information to understand how to go about um, 
mapping out and scoping Australia and who's who and how you get started uh, with an appropriate um, uh, scoping process that can get you to your goals a lot faster. So hopefully uh, that's been helpful. Um, I'll just put in some contact information there. Uh, if you want to contact us, uh, please, uh, please let us know, but happy to uh, answer any questions from there. Thank you very much.